we caught up with her and she explains to us why she got involved with this project. That's the thing. I mean, I feel like we, you know, me and Derek talked about it too. This is a prime example of New York City because New York City, you know, people who don't live here, they don't get it. They're like, it's so hard to do anything. It's expensive. Everyone's too busy. Everyone's, you know, and it's like, actually, when people, especially in the creative industry, and that goes to so many different mediums, we all support each other. And if anybody in New York City asks you to do a project like this that's so, first of all, important, and also with so many amazing people, you don't ask, you know, what's my call time, when, how many hours? The first thing you just say is, sure, sign me up. And it's like, I didn't need to, you know, hear the entire story of all the things they needed from me, what Derek told me, what the project was. I just said, email me whatever you need and I will be there and I will do it. And you know, that's that's the New York way and that's that's the way that things always happen in this city because we, we're all people that are busy. So we make things happen and you work harder to make everything happen for everybody. So Now, the opening part of this is driven by uh, a black, what's drag queen? Um, who are you referring to, Xander? I think so, because I, I don't know all the names. A lot. Right. Yeah, so Xander is incredible. Um, he's not a drag queen, he's Xander. Okay. He's a very famous nightlife personality. He's a and, club kid. Yeah, he's a club kid okay. and a good friend of mine. Okay. Um, and I've known him for 12 years. He's actually a funny story. One of the first people I met in New York, when I came here, I didn't really know anyone, and I went to this famous club of back in the day called APT, okay. which any house music heads will remember. It was an after hours. And I went, and I didn't know anyone. Someone's like, oh, you have to go to APT. You don't know APT. So I get there, and Xandro decides, he was the door guy, and he decides who comes in and who doesn't. And I went up to him, and he looked at me, and I was like, God, I don't know anyone. Like, in my head, I'm like, I am not getting in. And I was like, oh, just go up there and just be you. And he looked at me, he goes, come over here, come on in. And then I was like, oh, I like your necklace, and I touched his necklace. And he steps back, and in very Xander fashion, and you can Google him in the way he talks, or you saw it in the film, he's a character. He's like, please don't touch the jewelry. Do not touch the jewelry. And then he's like, but come on in. And, you know, it was kind of like a rite of passage that I didn't even realize was a rite of passage when it was happening. So now we laugh about it, but... You know, he was he was the gatekeeper, you know, and he he set the mood of this famous club and decided who would come in. And, you know, I didn't even, it, you know, in retrospect, I probably didn't even deserve to be in there, but I'm glad he saw something and let me in. So Wow. And so he makes it into this, obviously, because you, he... No, he's an icon. At he's an time, icon. He is the classic underground icon where it's like you know you didn't know who he was people don't need to know his but the minute you see him or hear him you remember him right but see i'm new to new york so i i got an excuse well, a lot of people are but now i know Last people in nightlife everybody knows xander he's 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 he's, he's w one of the characters that makes new york special so. now now this skit Talk to me about it. to be honest, yeah. the woman in it, Connie, uh -huh. um, with the long hair, you know, the other, right. one of the other girls in it, she's also actually a very famous nightlife and door person. Okay. And, um, and we work together. And, you know, some people will say she's a bitch. <laughs> um, and I don't think she'll mind that you say that. But she's a, a iconic, um, an iconic door person and nightlife personality. And... She's incredible. I mean, so the idea of it, explain it to the listeners that have not or might not have seen it. So the idea is basically it's um, all in support and to raise awareness um, about the plight of LGBT people in Syria. And it's a specific case that Derek is helping with and Zerkova Vodka is helping with where there was um, in Syria they... Um, they were they escaped and they decided to have in this pageant like a uh, Mr. Gay Syria pageant and they felt that they were more free and they unfortunately when they did the pageant somebody put it on social media and um, ISIS then targeted those five people who were identified in the social media to kill them 
um, for being gay, and actually two out of the five, their families themselves are looking for them to kill them. Um, as to retain regain the honor of their family and so the mission is and what they've been helping with is they took them to turkey and they're hiding and so um derek and the vodka zirkova is helping um with their legal bills and you know paying for them while they're in hiding to get them out because right now there's basically you know a mission to kill these five men just for being gay and so the the film was you know it, we live in this bubble right where these things are acceptable so you know it, it's a tribute to the Mr. Gay Syria pageant that they did originally and we're also playing fun because for us when you watch it it seems like such a fun campy really a celebration of gay culture and fashion and you know but really this is exactly why there's death threats against these people and they're actual in actual danger so while it's a light-hearted and a fun way to raise support if you really stop and think it's so sad that this whole thing that we think is a beautiful thing and really fun and enjoyable is something that these people are are about to be killed for so it, it, it's very powerful I, I just wanted you to explain it now you, you say that we kind of live in a bubble about um, you know in New York and there are a lot of gay men in New York etc and gay people and LGBTQ people um, however we had two transsexual people in Bushwick that were attacked just the other day. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, you know, it's not that I feel we've gotten... It's a long road, you know? I'm proud of where we've come. I feel like we live in a bubble because we have this privilege to live our lives this way. That does not mean that there's not people that are highly affected. There's, you know, tons of stories of LGBT youth and there's tons of, you know, who've been kicked out of their homes or there's, you know, homophobia all the time. But overall, at the end of the day, you put things in perspective, you know. Sure, th- these things are horrible for any anyone, especially the youth that experience homophobia. That has to end. But, you know... At the end of the day, we still have this privilege to be able to not be thrown off a building by our family to restore our honor, their honor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not that I'm downplaying our problems, not by a self person, but, you know, people's experiences in New York or in, you know, big cities. But there's people who have much bigger problems, and we have this privilege. So we should use our privilege right. to fight harder for people that have less than us because there are communities in other you know, countries. In other words, this ain't Russia, this ain't Syria, this is not a lot sure. of people. Okay. It's not, you right. know, and it's like, you know, I'm never going to say that to someone who's... People, everyone's got their problems, and if you're, you know, LGBT, you've got a lot of, you know, for a lot of people, you have a lot of things. You might have a lot of problems due to that, but people have even bigger problems over there, and so if you can... You should try and help in any way you can. And Speak- so, yeah, exactly. I didn't mean to cut you off. But speaking of Brooklyn, you recently gone into Brooklyn uh, with the Lady Fag franchise. Talk yeah, a little bit I was about doing that. A, you know, it's a funny thing. I did a party in Brooklyn. I did a few of them, and now I'm working on some other projects. But the funny thing is, is I've lived in Brooklyn the entire time I've been here for 12 years. I've been in Brooklyn, and um, I don't have that whole Manhattan Brooklyn beef that a lot of people have. I think of it as one big city. I mean, a lot of the young Brooklyn kids feel very empowered by saying they live in Brooklyn as opposed to Manhattan, and Manhattan's all commercial and, you know, for the for the rich. But, like, this is still New York, and we're, we're one bridge away. We're connected, you know. Bridge the gap, people. If you want to fight with people, fight with... Fight with LA. Don't fight with Brooklyn. Don't fight with Manhattan. And Br- Sorry, I'm kidding. I'm not fighting with you, LA. I'm just saying. Right. Manhattan and Brooklyn, we're one. Right. You know, enough. Now, speaking of Manhattan, you've controlled and taken over the city with some of the most beautiful parties, with some of the most beautiful people in the world. Period. End of story. You got you, probably this is the most attractive city in the country. Period. Anyway, um, tell me how Attractive's you. Attractive's all relative. Everybody's oh. attractive. Don't be that. Oh, but yeah. everybody's there's some, good, look, there's in some good looking people at my party. It's true. They're there are. There are. So, so tell me how you go from clothes and selling uh, uh, apparel to 
Well, you Googled me. Yeah, I know exactly who you are. I told you. you know, some, some people come up to you and they say they know who you are, but I know who you are. A long time ago. Yeah, I used to sell vintage clothing, and that made me fall in love with fashion. But that was a lifetime ago in Canada. And um, I used to work with... Um, a friend of mine, he's kind of my hero, his name was Will Monroe. He was an activist and a party promoter, but more than anything, he was a community builder. And he taught me that nightlife is so much more than hedonism. And it's it's about building community and giving a platform to people and creating a safe space for people to be able to be themselves and be creative. And, you know, and so I came here and that's... What happened? This is not your stereotypical dance party, though, because you don't hear, like, top 40 records. <laughs> <laughs> you know I've done my research. That's why she's cracking up. I believe, in, I believe in music. I mean, I think there's a time and a place for everything. I have no problem going to a bar and hearing top 40 and, you know, or going to a gay bar, but that's not what my parties are about. People come to them for a lot of reasons, but I do hope one of them is not only to get laid, I do hope everyone gets laid when they come to my party, but I hope that they're there for um, the music because I take a lot of time to work with DJs that I think are really talented and they don't have to be the big rock star names. It's about talent and, you know, I believe in, you know, the, the underground is really just, you know, it, it's the exact same thing as everything else. It's just not been discovered, discovered you know, yeah, yeah. so... And, and you've done a wonderful job of doing that. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. But the last the last thing I, I just want to say is you have made New York nightlife happen again. But do you think New it... New York nightlife was never dead. It will never die. That's and what I want to ask you. when people say shit like that, it's probably because they're sitting at home and watching Netflix. Ah, Lady Fag. Thank you so much. Thanking Lady Fag for...